National Broadcasting Company presents Lives of Great Men, a new series on great leaders in human progress presented by Dr. Edward Howard Griggs, distinguished lecturer, critic, and author of The New Humanism and many other books. In his talks, Dr. Griggs will build a story of civilization based on outstanding characters through the ages and how each one influenced his own and future times. This evening, Dr. Griggs will discuss Erasmus, Humanism, and the Reformation. We present Edward Howard Griggs. My friends, when the inspiration of the Renaissance was carried across the Alps into northern Europe, among more earnest, if less cultivated people, the first expression was in a humanism that sought to combine the culture of antiquity with the simple moral teaching of Christianity. This constructive reform was broken in upon by the storm of the Reformation, plunging the world again into theological controversy and religious wars, but followed by the counter-reformation within the Mother Church, deeply fertilizing the spirit. This double awakening of the North represents the second birth throes of the modern spirit. The first in the Italian Renaissance had been artistic and intellectual. The second in humanism and the Reformation, moral and religious in character. Erasmus is the leader of this northern awakening in its first and more normal phase. Loving luxury and cultivating wealthy patrons, disliking martyrdom and striving to avoid it, Erasmus was profoundly earnest in seeking to unite the Christian faith and classic culture in an educational reform which should begin at the top of European society and work down layer by layer until the world was purged and redeemed. Enemy of the dying system of the Middle Age, and prophet of modern enlightenment and toleration, solid in learning, tirelessly working in spite of frail health and recurring harassments, Erasmus pressed ever forward, striving for constructive aims, and so falling between the warring parties and furiously attacked from both sides, declining appointments that would have given him the ease he loved because they would have tied his hands, shrugging his shoulders and accepting, if reluctantly, the measure of martyrdom necessary to his mission, Erasmus deserves his place among the spiritual heroes. Born in Holland about 1467, the work of Erasmus is the first great impulse in the 16th century. Behind his birth is a romantic story that Charles Reed has used in The Cloister and the Hearth. It tells of the lovers, Gerhard and Margaret, who accepted their betrothal as marriage, and then Gerhard was compelled to sudden flight. Word came to him of Margaret's death, and in despair, he took monastic vows and entered the cloister. Returning later, he found Margaret not dead, but the mother of his little son. The struggle follows between the two conflicting obligations, churchly and human, the cloister and the hearth. Margaret, one of the finest characters in literature, rings absolutely true. How much of the story is fact, we cannot say, but some such romance would seem necessary to account for the ingrained bitterness of Erasmus toward the monastic life. Erasmus is said to have been his mother's child, with flaxen hair, gray-blue eyes, clear-cut features, and melodious voice. From childhood, he had the passion for books. While at school in Deventer, kept by a friend of his father's, he memorized Horace and Terence while learning to speak and write Latin, the common language of scholars in that age. Among his fellow pupils was Adrian, afterwards to become Pope. Left doubly orphaned at 11, Erasmus had a modest inheritance, this was misused by his guardians, who, to cover their fault, sought to cajole or force him to become a monk. The boy resisted heroically, the struggle lasting through several years. Finally, he was tricked into believing the monastery to be the one opportunity for the life of student and scholar to which he aspired. And he succumbed at 17. At first, he was allowed to study, but since books were his chief passion, they were soon taken from him, and he was given the hardest task to discipline his spirit. Frail in health and with no interest in monastic ideals, he was soon in abject misery. The prior's sympathy was aroused, and with a friendly bishop's aid, a temporary dispensation was granted, permitting him to go as secretary to the Bishop of Cambrai. He never re-entered the monastery. Later on in the period of his fame, strenuous efforts were made to compel his return, but Pope Leo X favored him and granted complete dispensation. As secretary to the bishop, Erasmus was launched on his career as student and scholar. But he chafed under the restrictions and longed for greater freedom. At 25, with the bishop's sanction, he went to the University of Paris. He had no money except a small allowance from the bishop, and to support himself began teaching the Greek language he was eagerly studying. He was in the happy situation of being able to teach what he most of all wanted to study. 
Among his pupils were several English noblemen who became his friends and protectors. His view of the intellectual life is well given in a letter of counsel to a young student. Read first the best books on the subject which you have in hand. Why learn what you will have to unlearn? The important thing for you is not how much you know, but the quality of what you know. Divide your day and give to each part of it a special occupation. Never work at night. It dulls the brain, hurts the health. Remember above all things that nothing passes away as rapidly as youth. We may be sure that Erasmus himself worked hard and long at night. He grew steadily forward during the five years at the University of Paris. In spite of meager income, he made an adventurous journey to Holland in a vain effort to recover some of his inheritance, but won a wealthy patron and a noble lady of Flanders. In those days, the impecunious literary worker had to depend on such patrons. A letter to his friend Batus, urging an appeal to the lady, gives the attitude of Erasmus. He says, go yourself to the lady. Tell her that I am in extreme distress, that a doctor's degree can be obtained to advantage only in Italy, and that a person so weak in health as I am cannot travel there with an empty purse. Tell her that Erasmus will do more credit to her liberality than the theologians whom she has taken into her favor. They can only preach sermons. I am writing books that will live forever. Theologians, there will always be in abundance. The like of me comes but once in centuries. What saves it from conceit is the gay humor and the fact that what he says is true. The like of Erasmus does come but once in centuries. Toward the close of the century, Erasmus made his first journey to England under the urging with the aid of Lord Mountjoy. It was the England of the new learning under the lead of Sir Thomas More and others. There were no dictionaries then, and Erasmus, with his knowledge of Greek, was warmly welcomed. He was entertained by nobles and met the royal family, getting a most favorable impression of the young prince who was to be Henry VIII. The permanent friendship was made with Sir Thomas More, of whom Erasmus has left us the best account we have. Erasmus expresses particular pleasure at the custom of the English ladies in kissing the arriving and departing guest. As he left England, all the monies he had received were taken from him at the custom house under a law similar to that of present-day Germany, and he arrived in Paris again penniless. In spite of this, he refused tempting offers of ecclesiastical appointment, as he had done in England, to devote himself to the scholar's life. In 1500, he published the Adages, a collection of wisdom out of the classic past. His reputation was rapidly growing, and used his influence to protect and free humanists charged with heresy. At 37, he issued the Christian Knights Manual, by which he sought to foster independent consciousness in the North. He urged lessened taxation and held that kings should not go to war except to benefit their whole people, a view far in advance of the age. After further wanderings, including a second visit to England, he was able to carry out his long-cherished plan to go to Italy for his doctor's degree. He crossed Switzerland on horseback, and comments on the stuffy rooms of the Swiss inns, their impossible stoves, and the sour wine that gave him indigestion, with no word of the marvelous circle of mountains rising to the blue bosom of the sky. When he reached Italy, he was enraptured. Taking his degree at a northern university, he pressed on to Rome. It was the brilliant Rome of Julius II of Michelangelo, but far from the simplicity of the apostolic gospel to which Erasmus was striving to call back the world. He enjoyed the association with eminent scholars and was urged to accept high churchly appointment and remain. Reluctantly, he declined and returned to France to continue his work freely. At 45, he published his Praise of Folly. In this work, he deliberately wore the cap and bells, but only to use more freely the rapier of his satire on the evils of the time. Then in 1516 appeared his most epoch-making work, an edition of the Greek New Testament with a Latin translation and accompanied by paraphrases and pungent comment. It is hard for us to understand how revolutionary this work was, for ignorance of the Bible at the time was profound. A hundred thousand copies of the work were sold in France alone. Let me give a few sentences of his comment to show why this work was so effective. St. Paul says he would rather speak five words with a reasonable meaning in them than 10,000 in an unknown tongue. They chant nowadays in our churches in what is an unknown tongue and nothing else while you will not hear a sermon once in six months telling people to amend their lives, theologians are never tired of discussing the modes of sin. Why is it not enough simply to hate sin? Is all vanity. Compared with Christ, the best of men are but worms. His enemies fiercely attacked Erasmus, 
But Pope Leo X warmly favored him, sanctioned the book, and Erasmus weathered the storm. He was now at the height of his fame and influence with strong hope that the reform from within would carry through. When the year following the publication of the New Testament, Luther posted his thesis on the door of Wittenberg Church. Luther's original intention was to invite discussion among theologians with the hope of moral reform. But his strong protest caught the spirit of national awakening in Germany with resentment at the overlordship of the South and the draining away of needed funds by Italy. Thus he was quickly pushed beyond his first purpose and with political support behind him, turned to swing the Saxon broad axe. It was said widely that Erasmus laid the egg that Luther hatched. Erasmus heard it and admitted it as true, but added that the egg he laid was a harmless pullet, while Luther had hatched a gamecock. That gives his attitude well. Believing strongly in enlightenment and constructive reform, deprecating theological controversy and deploring the breaking up of Christendom, he could not conscientiously join the party causing the break. On the other hand, when summoned to Rome to write against Luther, that also he could not do, since many of Luther's ideas were those for which he himself had fought. So he stood between, not the cause of cowardice, but from sincere conviction, and was furiously attacked by both sides. For instance, Luther, who had been very deferential toward Erasmus as the leading liberal thinker, when he found that Erasmus would not join the Protestant party, turned bitterly against him. In his table talk, Luther says, Erasmus of Rotterdam is the vilest miscreant that ever disgraced the earth. He made several attempts to drag me into his snares, and I should have been in danger, but that God lent me special aid. He is a very Caiaphas. When Pope Adrian, who had been his schoolmate, wrote confidentially to Erasmus, urging him to come to Rome and write against Luther, Erasmus replied, Your holiness requires my advice, and you wish to see me. I would go to you with pleasure if my health allowed, but the road over the Alps is long. Meanwhile, you shall have my honest heart in writing. As to writing against Luther, I have not learning enough. My popularity such as I had is turned to hatred. One party says I agree with Luther because I do not oppose him. The other finds fault with me because I do oppose him. I did what I could. I advised him to be moderate, and I only made his friends my enemies. Those counsel you best to advise gentle measures. Alas, that I in my old age should have fallen into such a mess like a mouth into a pitch pot. What good can I do at Rome? It was said in Germany that I was sent for. If I write anything at Rome, it will be thought that I am bribed. If I write temperately, I shall seem trifling. If I copy Luther's style, I shall stir a hornet's nest. In spite of the suffering, under attack from both sides, and the misery over defeat of his aims, Erasmus went steadily forward with his work. Pope Leo accepted with kindly favor the dedication to him of the edition of St. Jerome. In 1521, Erasmus published the familiar colloquies, a crowning example of his humor and satire devoted to his constructive moral aim. Erasmus hated war, especially war over religion. As storm clouds gathered over Europe, he took refuge in Basel, Switzerland. With all the attack upon him, he was universally recognized as the leading scholar in Europe, and a veritable procession came to Basel with gifts from all sources. Could his dream have been realized of constructive moral reform and intellectual enlightenment? resulting in a church and world purged of corruption with no breaking up of Christendom, that had been a destiny, but it was not to be. With all his disappointment, he worked steadily to the end and died saddened at Baal in 1536. I have portrayed Erasmus with peculiar satisfaction because his aim is the aim of my own work. Our time needs not destructive revolution, but just the humanism, the reform in character and conduct, the toleration and cultural enlightenment to which Erasmus dedicated his life. Erasmus, Humanism, and the Reformation has been the subject of this eighth program in a new series titled Lives of Great Men, presented by Dr. Edward Howard Griggs, distinguished lecturer, critic, and author. Next week, Dr. Griggs will speak on Giordano Bruno, the martyr of science. Copies of tonight's discussion on Erasmus may be obtained by addressing the National Broadcasting Company, Radio City, New York, or the station to which you are listening. This is the National Broadcasting Company.